Welcome to Spotlight on Sports. I'm your host, Harold Bell. Today here on Spotlight on Sports, we'll take a look at professional boxing, the state of professional boxing. My special guest is a young man that's an author, businessman, historian, lawyer, actor. He wears many hats. He's one of the most sought after boxing authorities in the country. He is the colorful and controversial publisher and editor of Boxing Illustrated Magazine, Mr. Burt Randolph Sugar. Right after these messages, we will be right back with the Sugar Man. We're here at the Grand Hyatt in Washington, D.C. in the Grand Slam Sports Bar talking to Burt Randolph Sugar, the publisher and editor of Boxing Illustrated Magazine. Burt, is professional boxing out of control? You can almost restate that. Are there any controls? <clears throat> Does anybody care? What happens is, with 60% of all fighters coming from America, 70% of all world-class fighters coming from America, 80% of all champions, and 90% of all money, two of the three sanctioning groups are out of Mexico City and Caracas, Venezuela. They don't give a damn about the Americans. Mm -hmm. They're trying to line their own pockets. There is no control between athletic commissions. Nobody seems to have the same rules. The promoters are running the sport. To answer your question in one word or less, <laughs> yes. Bert, I guess the other question, the follow-up question would be, should boxing be brought under government control? Well, now you got a problem. The government is trying to scale back every program. How would you feel about taking welfare money or school money and putting it into boxing? You wouldn't be happy, and neither would the people be. And then the federal government can't get a postcard across the street in two weeks. So the question becomes, how do you do it? I think the state should band together. I think they should talk together. I think they should be together. Right now, a fighter who is hypothetically suspended in one jurisdiction for being knocked out picks up his gloves and his trunks and moves to the next jurisdiction to get knocked out again. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some interfacing jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. If this was the International Widget Association, they'd talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Boxing just doesn't talk. It's an individualistic sport, and nobody seems to give a damn. Mm -hmm. Bert, you know, you have all these different organizations. Uh, say if we wanted to form our own organization, all we got to do is come up with an uh, alphabet uh, type of organization. I don't uh, like that, Harold. Let me tell you why. Your name is Bell and mine Sugar, and guess what the initials would be? What would it be? BS. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to work, although they all are. Yeah, <laughs> full of BS. <laughs> Bro, let's take a look at uh, one of the things that's happening everybody is talking about. What does the future of Mike Tyson look like? Where is Mike and where is he going? I think he's going to Michigan City, Indiana for a small vacation at the, at the behest of the state. Uh, there is some pretty damning edit evidence against Mike. Uh, you have to understand he has four counts against him, number one of which is rape, two and three are deviant conduct, and four is confinement. Now, confinement in this case is similar to finding a man standing on, over a body with a gun smoking. Mm -hmm. You get him for or charge him with assault with a deadly weapon, homicide, and littering the sidewalk. It's a lesser included. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to get him on something. You have to understand Indiana is not the most liberal of states, no matter if it is in the Midwest. It's a southern state by nature. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's had some experience with this. When Jack Johnson was convicted of Man Act violations, guess what state it was? Mm. Indiana. That Is convicted that right? Mm. They're going to have a chance at a second heavyweight champion. Mm. Now, Bert, do you think the fallout from the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas, and of course now the Kennedy nephew is in trouble, do you think this may have some influence on the case with Mike Tyson? Oh, I think it brings it to the uh, attention and the fore. Obviously, uh, also this case probably will be on television. Mm -hmm. It'll get higher ratings in General Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I think all of that leads to it. Uh, you're correct in uh, the assessment that basically mm -hmm. there's been a higher awareness of the, uh, and this goes far beyond harassment, what he's mm -hmm. charged with, but at least that aspect of it. And the second point is he is a high profile fighter and personality. Mm -hmm. And that's, you have to understand, we're in a tabloid world. Mm -hmm. We like to peek through keyholes. 
right. and we'll get a chance right. with Mike Tyson starting January 27th. Mm -hmm. It's a hard fight for him. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, Mike Tyson's <coughs> main man, and uh, I guess his godfather at the time, say you white guys been picking on him. I'm talking about Don King. He's saying this is racism. Uh, people coming after Don him and Mike. Don says that about anything, though. Mm -hmm. Don't you understand, Don? Nobody has played black, white better than Don. He uses... John Thompson has. Well, John hasn't played it as well as yeah. Don. Don got into boxing, and the man who brought him in said he talked to fighters' souls. And he did, black mm -hmm. to black. Mm -hmm. He delivered George Foreman to the government of Zaire, black to black. Mm -hmm. And when he wants, he turns the other way. Right. Uh, Don is a master manipulator. And uh, listen, it's Don's style. Yeah. Don King is for Don King. You and I both know that. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're both aware of that. So. Well, but, I'm, you know, Don, to me, and everybody asks me about his charges against him that were made in magazines and on television, he proves to me all people are equal. Blacks mm -hmm. can steal as much as whites from boxers. Only in America. Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> That's what he says. Oh, yes. Only oh. in America. And he can hand deliver Jose Suleiman of the WBC. Yeah. Uh, Don is a... Um, He's a special case. He's uh, he's going to be studied for many years to come. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I look I look at Don and some of the things that he has done in boxing. This recent uh, uh, piece they ran on PBS TV, uh, one of the individuals, of course, uh, Tim Witherspoon, has a suit against Don in in court right now, and it's worth twenty five million dollars. Uh, Don uh, Tim Witherspoon was the champion and went over to one of the twice. foreign. He was yeah, twice champion. Twice champion went over to one of the uh, foreign countries to fight to defend his title. I can think against Bone Crusher Smith. No, this Who was against it? Frank Bruno. Frank, yeah. that's right, Frank Bruno. Now they made millions of dollars in TV. The and Gilad Frank Bruno Gate. made nine hundred thousand as a challenger. That's right. And Timmy came away with a check for ninety thousand dollars. You thank Don King. Don. Uh, Don said, well, there's so much for my son, Carl. $250,000. <laughs> Didn't throw a punch. Well, Carl threw one punch once. He fell on his nose trying. Yeah. Uh, Don likes to make money, but he makes it for himself. He doesn't make it for his boxers. Yeah. yeah. And this was a special case. Timmy is not going to take a step backwards, albeit there have been threats made against him. Uh, that suit comes up for trial soon. Mm -hmm. Bert, what we're going to do, we're going to take a break <laughs> right here. When we come back, we're going to take a look at the heavyweight boxing uh, division and see what the future lies there because the heavyweight division has always set the tone for boxing. So we want to take a look at that. We'll be right back after this message. All right, Bert, the heavyweight division it has always set the tone for professional boxing. What does it look like to you? Uh, Evander Holofield is the undisputed champion. Where do we go from here? Mike Tyson, of course, is in limbo because of... Uh, his trial coming up in, in Indiana soon. What does the heavyweight division look like to you? I think if Mike Tyson is put away for any period of time, it's going to bode badly for boxing. He has a tremendous attraction. Uh, Mike Tyson draws fans. I'll give you an instance. Mike Tyson against Evander Holyfield. We were supposed to pay up to $42.95 to see it on pay-per-view. Evander Holyfield against somebody else's Italian pasta doughboy, Francesco Damiani, you're getting for free. Does that tell you that Holyfield was the attraction or that Tyson was the attraction? Mm -hmm. Holyfield is a, he's a wonderful guy. I like him immensely, but he has all the excitement of Mount Rushmore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, his idea of a good time is wearing brown shoes with a black tux. Mm -hmm. He cannot mm, draw the fans in. And if you look down the scale of heavyweights, there are very few who can. George Foreman, mm -hmm. I mean, you can go to his next fight and listen to his arteries harden. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Riddick Bowe, mm -hmm. if he's not in a wrestling bout beforehand, uh, or someone else. But it is a very, very sterile looking group of challengers. Mm -hmm. Bert, did Muhammad Ali spoil us? I think Muhammad Ali spoiled a lot. Mm -hmm. He was too good, too much too often. Mm -hmm. Now we're being fed good, good fighters, and in Tyson's case on the cusp of greatness, mm -hmm. but not exciting fighters in personality, though Tyson is in the ring. Mm -hmm. Therefore, and it always happens after a great champion, there is a declination. Patterson after Marciano, Tunney after Dempsey, 
Ezra Charles after Joe Lewis. You always come off a great one to something that doesn't quite fulfill the expectation, doesn't satisfy your appetite. Mm -hmm. I think the same thing is happening now. Yeah. You know, I knew where we were in trouble, of course, uh, when Larry Holmes came out of retirement. Now, <laughs> Larry Holmes and George Foreman. <laughs> I, I both they're in a belly bump. Yeah, contest. belly bump the contest. And, and, and Larry, who's coming out of retirement to build another building, I think, he's going to fight Ray Mercer, merciless Ray Mercer. Uh, and I love Larry. Larry mm -hmm. is fun. I mean, I'll tell you how much I love I gave a roast for him about a year ago. And I got up and I said, how can you roast a man who can't even pronounce his own name, La Holmes? <laughs> he wanted to get up and hit me till they explained to him what a roast was. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry is a very nice man, but he shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's a grandfather. He should be out collecting Social Security the way everybody else's age is doing it. Mm -hmm. But are there any, any white hopes out there? You know, they usually come up with one every five or ten years. Do we have any out there? You saw Tommy Morrison. <laughs> uh, I told you about letting white guys in the <laughs> ring. Would you tell them go, go away? Uh, there isn't, and even Emmanuel Stewart will tell you mm -hmm. that boxing does need its white fighters to get rooting interest into the game. Mm -hmm. Tommy Morrison, Francesco Damiani, you answer the yeah. question. I've just ran through them. You're right. There are none out there, definitely. What is the most exciting uh, division right now in professional boxing as far as you're concerned? It always has been the middleweight. There is a good fight coming up. James Tony. Mike McCallum for the basically what I would call the undisputed middleweight crown. Then you drop down, Julio Cesar Chavez is in a halfway house. Mm -hmm. He's in one of those junior divisions that nobody knows what the hell it is. Mm -hmm. And the lightweight division's exciting. Mm -hmm. So really what happens is, and it's always happened in a depression era, and I don't care what George Bush says, we're in a depression era now, the lesser classes have always come to the fore. Heavyweights work in prosperity, lighter classes work in down times. 1930s, bad time for America. We had a bunch of clowns running through the heavyweight division. Max Baer, Primo Canera, who cared? It was Jimmy McLarnon, it was Henry Armstrong, it was Barney Ross, it was Tony Canzanieri. Lightweights and welterweights all. Same thing today. Lesser weight classes are the exciting weight classes. Right. We're, we're looking around boxing right now. Of course, there's Don King, there's Bob Aaron, Lou Duva. I guess those are the big names as far as promoters are concerned right now. Do promoters have too much control over the fight game? Traditionally, they always have, have that. Yeah. There's a new equation, though, and it's called television. And it's gone beyond just booking a fight. HBO or its stepsister, TBKO, now puts up the money. Mm -hmm. It put up $45 million for the aborted Tyson-Holyfield fighter. Mm -hmm. Champion goes first, Holyfield-Tyson fight. So while the promoters have power, it now rests in the hands of the pay-per-view operators. Mm -hmm. New equation. Yeah. You know, Bert, of course, um, <laughs> uh, Bob Aaron just recently... Uh, came out and said that from now on, any fight that he is in control of, there will be mandatory AIDS testing. I guess this all is coming about after the, the tragic story of Magic Johnson. Uh, he revealed that he had contacted the AIDS virus. Do you think there should be mandatory uh, testing for AIDS in professional sports? Well, you always have the question. You have to balance society's needs against the human rights. Some of these men have privacy don't want it violated. Irving Johnson is a special case. He is using it to his and society's good. There might be some people out there that don't want to hear about this. Mm -hmm. So you've got to balance these two equities. What is societal good? What is individual rights? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure Bob Aaron isn't grandstanding, mm -hmm. but you're going to come to a point where this scourge is going to have to be seen and boxing, as you know, has closer contact than any other sport, and it might have to be done. Right. You know, Bert, I think definitely all professional sports uh, should have mandatory uh, AIDS testing because most contact sports, there's blood, and anybody's blood may come from any time, basketball, 
football, baseball. So uh, it's something that but we're really going to learn. Not hockey. Not, not hockey. Definitely I mean, not as, hockey. As, as There's Rodney, very little blood in hockey. In the, <laughs> as Rodney Dangerfield said once, he went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. Yeah, yeah. How about that? <laughs> Well, what we're going to do here, we're going to take a, a break, and I'm going to come back to talk with Bert about the greatest fighters of all time right after this, this message. Of course, uh, always big conversation, controversy about who was or is the greatest fighter of all time. If you had your last money in your pocket, which I do. You do. And, uh, of course, it was between going to see the greatest fighter of all time and eating. Which would you do, and who would that fighter be, and why? Yes, no, and maybe. Okay. Uh, no, I would go <laughs> to see the greatest fighter of all time. I wrote a book called The 100 Greatest Fighters of All Time. I rated them pound for pound. I squished them together. I wrote it at a bar. You can say anything <laughs> you want. Uh, they all fought at their primes, and they all, I looked at them, in a prism, I really looked at him through the bottom of a glass, to pick him. And my greatest fighter of all time was born Walker Smith in 1920 in Detroit, Michigan, better known as Sugar Ray Robinson. The sugar man could do it all. It's the only man I ever saw throw a knockout punch going backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, second greatest fighter, Henry Armstrong, held three titles at the same time, one in one year. 21 of 21 fights, 20 by knockout, which ain't all bad. Third greatest of all time, you have to really go back, a guy named Harry Greb, the only man to beat Gene Tunney. Then I got to the heavyweights with uh, Dempsey and, uh, and Lewis. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I didn't get to the man who calls himself the greatest till number 10, Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. Great man, I mean, but how can you tell when you do gradations, you weren't saying, they were less great. Mm -hmm. You were just putting them in the slots. And I just thought, Ali, who admitted he emulated Sugar Ray Robinson's moves, mm -hmm. I couldn't move him above the man he was imitating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what about, uh, we're talking about heavyweights, and of course, Muhammad Ali imitating uh, Sugar Ray Robinson. What about Jack Johnson? He took a lot of his uh, style and characteristics uh, from Jack Johnson, too, didn't he? Yes, but Johnson you have to understand, it was probably the greatest defensive fighter in the history of boxing. Mm -hmm. He could catch any punch, but he rarely hit you until you hit him. Mm -hmm. Jack Johnson was a great, great fighter, but he rarely threw punches with bad intentions until you hit him. Mm -hmm. He was satisfied all day just to play backstop. Mm -hmm. He just caught punches. You could, couldn't hit him. But if you did, you were in trouble. Uh, Jack Johnson was... Ali's style was less Johnson's than it was Robinson's. He used speed. And what the problem was that Ali so fertilized the field that for years thereafter you saw kids coming up trying to imitate Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the speed. And if you look at Ali's style, it's all speed oriented. He leans back from punches, he pulls away, he moves. And if they weren't that fast, they were gonna get clocked. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the kids did because Ali could pull it off, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. But what about the guy uh, who uh, finished uh, untimely death as the undefeated, only undefeated heavyweight champion of all time, Rocky Marciano? Tell us how you felt about, about Rocky. Well, I rated him number 19, mm -hmm. which aggravated everybody that followed him. I didn't want to aggravate him. I just thought that Rocky Marciano had good skills. Mm -hmm. He had greater determination and heart than most fighters in the history of boxing. He gave 150% of his himself, but his arms were the shortest in the heavyweight division's history of all champions, and he took a lot of punches. Mm -hmm. He killed you, but by the same token, if you look at the four great fights that he had, Archie Moore, Joe Lewis, Ezra Charles, and Joe Walcott, the average age of his opponents was 39.5 years of age. Mm -hmm. That didn't exactly elevate him higher than 19 in my mind's eye. Mm -hmm. I had Roberto Duran ahead of him, Willie Pep, nobody ever hit him, obviously Ali, some mm -hmm. of the ones we've mentioned. Mm -hmm. Marciano was great, but 19 I figured I was stretching it a little. Mm -hmm. And just because he retired at 49 and 0, he beat 
at the time, not men who were in their primes. Mm -hmm. In fact, Joe Lewis, way over the hill, October 30th, 1951, last fight, out jabbed him for four rounds. Mm -hmm. Bert, you know, uh, looking at uh, the fight, the fight game, and of course talking about the, the greatest fighter of all time, who were the two greatest matchups uh, in any division that you would you would just I mean go see at any time any place the two greatest uh, uh, guys who, who matched up well in the ring that really drew the people out and, and you got your money's worth. Well, my favorite fight of all time happened 50 years ago, Joe Lewis and Billy Kahn. What a brilliant fight! Mm -hmm. And then of course it was Ali and Fraser. Fraser would not have won if Ali had been in his prime, but remember he'd been defrocked for three and a half years for failing to step forward for induction. Mm -hmm. uh, other great fights and fighters, Willie Pep, Sandy Sadler in a lesser division, uh, Zale, Graziano. And I really think Tommy Hearns and Sugar, Sugar Ray, Ray Leonard. Leonard. Yeah. yeah. Though I don't think that even Sugar Ray thought he won that, uh, had a, got a draw out of that second fight. Mm -hmm. These were great matchups, and it takes greatness rubbing against greatness, which is perhaps what Tyson and Holyfield missed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, looking at those uh, matchups between Sugar Ray Leonard and, of course, Tommy Hearns, and, of course, one of the great boxers, uh, Marvin Hagler, uh, left the ring very disappointed after the, that Sugar Ray Leonard about. Where, where does he come in history? Uh, Marvin is probably the third, fourth greatest middleweight of all time. Lovely, gentle person outside the ring. Don't, don't cross his path in the ring. He always said, that's my office. Uh, great, great middleweight behind Ketchell and Greb and, uh, and Robinson. In fact, that was the greatness of boxing in the, in, the, in the 80s. The four greats of the 80s, Duran, Leonard, Hagler, and Hearns all fought each other. And we miss that rondelay, that interplay today. Well, Bert, you got the last word. I want to thank you for taking time I out to be do, here. I always do, Harold. I want to thank you for taking time out to be here on Spotlight on Sports. And uh, that's going to be it for this segment. Uh, until next time, I'm Harold Bell, and we'll see you then. Hey, big boy.